party here. So many of you, we hope, have had experience with MHL and with the MHL comes a great staff. And with this staff, we have a wonderful member of the team, Mr. Smith. So we'd like to have him present his path to Michigan to us today. So please give him a warm one. Thank you. I think um, at least one person, Brian, um, where's Brian? You know, Brian wanted to hear my story. So at least one person in here wants to hear it. Um, <laughs> but no, I, um, I've been here just over three years now uh, as an engineering technician at the MHL. And it's been, um, you know, seeing a lot of uh, familiar faces in here um, is great. So I appreciate, you know, you guys giving me the opportunity to, to talk. Um, I put a lot of pictures on here. I've tried to have this be, um, you know, fairly... Uh, just, you know, kind of flow with, uh, as I look at a picture and, you know, kind of have some memories with things. So there's a lot of pictures. I hope to get through all of them. So if you have um, any questions about anything or any comments, uh, we'll get to those at the end. So um, I'll talk more about this picture that's up here right now in a little while, uh, but um, let's get into it. So um, here's my contribution <laughs> to the rock, uh, you know, Friday, um, seriously though, it, Kevin, Kevin and I, professor Mackey and I went to high school together and this is us in cross country. So, um, here's professor Mackey. I'm down over here on the end. Um, and, uh, actually Kevin yesterday told me that Kevin Van is also, a, um, a Naval architecture grad. Um, so. But yeah, Kevin, uh, The Rock wasn't you know that great of a runner, but he was uh, best friends um, <laughs> with Professor Mackey. So I didn't have you know I didn't have any rock clothes, but that you know there's that. So um, high school again, you know I enjoyed cross country. I enjoyed the camaraderie. Um, it doesn't look much like it now, but I you know I was a fairly decent runner back then. So um, we got third at states my senior year, which was great. Uh, in high school, and I think I've tried to pass this along as well to interns I've had a chance to, to interact with, is that I'm, I'm still you know, interested, but I was really interested in art and graphic design back then. Um, in my senior year, I attended a uh, technical school that was in our, our, you know, our city uh, for graphic, graphic design in the afternoons. So, um, and even before high school, uh, when I was in, uh, the Ninja Turtles were a big thing uh, right when I was in middle school or so. So as an artist, I would draw um, my friend's um, favorite Ninja Turtles for, you know, for like a quarter. So that's how things got started for me um, in high school. Um, I didn't have the, so I've got two brothers. Uh, one's a structural engineer and he's been at the same firm uh, since he graduated. And my, you know, my other brother has worked in the hotel industry ever since he graduated. Uh, you're going to see here that my path is completely different than that. Um, so I think when I was all done, it was about, you know, three major universities and, you know, three community colleges. So um, as I go through all this, I'll encourage you to keep trying, you know, to find the thing you know that you're passionate about whether it's you know as a naval architect if it's propellers hulls you know the ocean in general you know fluids uh, hydrofoils anything so but you'll see here that um, after high school uh, I started off at Northwestern Michigan College in Traverse City so I you know I'm from from Traverse City which is you know about four hours north of here for fine art and graphic design um, and you know enjoyed that Grand Valley State, uh, I think one of the biggest reasons that I went there um, was because my older brother went there and um, I wasn't, you know, I, it, it's going to take, you'll see here in a bit, it's going to take me a long time to kind of try to really figure out where I fit. So there's Grand Valley graphic design. Um, I ended up over on the east side of the state, uh, you know, for a few years and school wasn't doing it for me for a while. So, you know, you'll see this, this is kind of a theme where I start and stop. Um, so I got into construction, um, all different types from residential to, you know, brick laying, uh, flat work, concrete, you know, those types of things. And um, it's nice now when I get to work with interns at the MHL, I've got a breadth of experience in a lot of different things. Um, so I try to bring that into, um, you know, the internship program that we have. So automotive technician as well. Um, and then I also tried 
Um, I was trying to work on my math. Uh, math has never been a strong suit. Um, for a while there, I thought I was going to go to Kettering, and you know, and that never happened either. So, um, moved back home. So back up north. Uh, you'll see in a bit here that I have no pictures, no nothing from like that, you know, from that era. So otherwise, I'd have more. Um, the only picture I really have of some of the construction work I did was, um, you know, my my own house. So I was working construction, and then in the uh, the evenings afterwards, it took me about ten months to finish my own house. So um, I also put this in here because picture me sitting up here um, on the roof. I came out and um, questioning my life, considering the army. So at this point, you know, 18 years old, graduate high school, 17, 18, I'm now 27. So nothing's really clicking and working for me. And at 27, uh, I said, okay, um, I went to the, uh, the Marine recruiters and they told me I was too old. So um, I went to the army and they said, yep. Um, and this is at the, you know, right around the time, um, the height of both conflicts, so Afghanistan and Iraq. So they were taking anybody. So they took, you know, 27 year old me. Um, so that's that uh, to, you know, my, my journey into the army. It was a, it was a tough, it was, when I made the decision, it was easy for me. I don't know how hard it was for my family. So, you know, during the, you know, the height of both conflicts. Um, but anyways, my MOS, my specialty was a cavalry scout. So um, think of, you know, any movie or anything you've seen or any experience you've had with folks that are in the infantry. It's very similar. It's just, it's more you know, vehicle based, more about uh, observation, things like that. So where I went to basic training, they don't do it there anymore. Um, and I'm not sure the base that they do it at, but I went through Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, and one of the first pictures here, I'll show you the guy that convinced me to go airborne. So I didn't have it in my contract when I went to basic training, um, but uh, one of my good buddies, you know, that I became friends with, still friends with, uh, convinced me to, you know, to, to get airborne in my contract. So I was like, hey, why not? Um, and then uh, I did five years in the Army, and uh, I was in the 82nd Airborne Division. I was in a, a, a cavalry regiment. Um, we went to Iraq. Uh, and then Haiti in 2010. So there'll be pictures for all of this, you know, and I can talk through those things. So um, this is the guy that said, hey, he had airborne school, because at this point they were standing up these units and they were, they wanted more um, folks that were uh, airborne qualified in these, you know, these cavalry units, and then they attach them to other units. So Stalker, his last name is Stalker, Drew, is the one that convinced me to go airborne. So um, this is, a, kind of the quintessential, you know, guys in combat, um, dirty, dark. Um, it's, you know, you're going to see a lot of pictures here where um, I put this one in here because for a while until our leadership told us we couldn't do it, we all had our own little, um, I was Uncle Smith, you'll see it better in here in a little bit because I was the crazy, I was the older uncle. I was older than all the guys by about 10 years. So, um, and uh, Knobloch, he was big country. <laughs> and uh, Arthur Robinson, um, he was, because uh, that was when um, uh, um, the Tom Hanks movie um, was big, you know, with his, with his friend Bubba. So um, but we all had our nicknames. We all made fun of each other equally. And, you know, we all had each other's backs. So um, nobody smiled in pictures mostly. So you'll see with, you know, with all these. So um, the interesting thing about a lot of the guys that I went through with is because they stood this unit up um, you know, newly, um, you'll see on a lot of the guys, you know, their right shoulder under the flag, they don't have a combat patch like, you know, like this guy did. So we were all really new. We went through, um, you know, a lot of them went through basic training together and then we did all of our training before we deployed together. So this is all of our first experience with, with Iraq. Um, night vision goggles, driving at night, getting stuck. Um, this was a regular occurrence, but this is what it looked like most of the time. So imagine taking, you know, a uh, um, a paper towel tube and looking through that, and everything's green. That's what you know night vision goggles look like. This is what it looks like to try and grab a couple hours of sleep. Um, whatever we were doing, if we were on patrol, you know, that's a rooftop somewhere. You know, if there was three or four people together on this patrol, um, you know, that's that's at times how you slept. Uh, 
And that's, you know, why in some of these pictures, you see that everybody looks so tired. You could sleep like that at the drop of a hat. So this is me um, with my, uh, my Uncle Smith tag. So, um, and again, this is, you know, this is, this is in Baghdad. Um, and uh, not much else to talk about with that. This is um, an MRE eating. Um, never, you know, if you guys haven't had the chance to have MREs, there's, there's 24, so there's two boxes they come in. Maybe two of them are good, and everybody takes those first. So if you can't get one of the good ones that you like, and I'm not sure what the flavors are these days, if you can get either some of the, the real nasty cheese and crackers or the peanut butter and crackers, you'd be okay. So um, in there, you know, there's, there's what it looks like, you know, eating, eating in the field, we'd eat them in the field or, you know, when we were deployed, things like that. So, um, all right, let me. Actually, I think, okay. I think, yeah, the video is coming up here in a little bit. So this is now when we're back. We got back. We were part of the surge. We were there for 15 months. We come back to uh, Fort Bragg. This was a jump that we did in Nevada. Most of the jumps we did um, were actually into, you know, North Carolina around Fort Bragg. Um, but this one was one where we actually had, they actually had professional photographers, things like that. Um, and we, you know, we jumped into Nevada for, a, um, for an exercise. So take a look at the gear that everybody's got. Um, depending on what your specialty was and what you were doing, uh, your rucksack could weigh anywhere from, you know, 60 to 90 pounds. Um, and you'll see here in a second that basically you're waddling to the door and this is how you jump out. So this is where it's rucksack is. Um, you don't land with it like that, but in a few pictures, I'll be able to show you how, you know, how you drop it, you know, things like that. So, um, Hopefully the video, I can, you know, I can manipulate the video here in a little bit. I wasn't able to edit it, um, but I'm gonna, gonna go through it a little bit so you can see what it looks like to be inside of an aircraft uh, for a jump. And actually, um, you can see this one person, they probably dropped it too soon. This one person up here, that's what it would look like when you drop your, you know, your rucksack. So that drops about 25 feet below you on a, on a cord that's connected to your, to your pair, you know, to your harness. So, let me just, I wanna figure out where that video is. Okay, it's still coming up. So this was from, from Nevada, from that jump. So somebody's on the drop zone taking pictures. Uh, so if you've watched any, you know, any videos or, you know, any movies about, you know, airborne, you know, band of brothers, um, stuff like that, paratroopers have the boots and they tuck their, you know, their, their pants into the, you know, into the boots. Um, it's a way of distinguishing themselves from, um, they call people that can't jump or aren't jump qualified, they call them legs. So. Um, if you're jump qualified, you, you know, you tuck your, tuck your pants into your boots. Um, and then as a, as a scout in the cavalry during, you know, these, um, these Fridays or whatnot, when we're wearing our uniforms, we could wear our, our Stetsons. So, and I don't think I'm wearing, I'm not wearing spurs. So, but you can wear your spurs too. So this is part of a, um, I'd call it like a two day long hazing event, but, um, this was an event, you know, for, for camaraderie, for um, brotherhood, for building uh, relationships and things. So basically you're doing all of these land navigation and all these uh, skills that are critical to, you know, to your specialty that you're doing. You're getting very little sleep. So again, sometimes the pictures like these are because of professional photographers there. So, um, and in my kit, uh, maybe that's like the compass, um, magazines, for my rifle and then, you know, certain medical things like that. So, and you can see now that I actually have, cause I was in combat, I have my, my combat patch under the, the flag. Um, more training. Uh, I probably trained less than what people would consider. I would say that I probably did more paperwork and cut more grass than actual training, um, which is the case with a lot of big conventional units. Um, 
it's unfortunate, but this would be a range where we'd be, you know, moving with partners and things like that, shooting, you know, moving, communicating. Um, so, all right, so here's the jump. I'm going to try my best to show certain parts of it, talk through it, um, and then, you know, skip the rest. I will say that there's a bit of uh, colorful language right at the end, but it's been vetted by, um, by adults. Uh, so, um, but this was a jump that I was on. So um, in my, my write-up, it said, you know, that I, I, I eventually got jump master qualified. So I went to a school, um, you know, and, and, and passed to allow me to exit paratroopers from, you know, from an aircraft. So this is me on a safety duty. Um, the jump master, the, the jump master has a camera on his uh, glasses. So the quality is not that great. You know, uh, GoPros have come a long time, you know, a long way since then, but um, I'll skip through this a little bit. Uh, this is a C-130. They're loud. Um, so this is, this would be what it, you know, what it would sound like. Uh, you could have earplugs. Some people could sleep. Um, sometimes they, you know, we'd have a jump. Um, some people could sleep in an environment like this. So um, those are the seats that we, you know, we'd sit on. They're all the, you know, that, uh, that webbing and it's bare, you know, it's, it's loud. It's either cold during the winter, it's hot during the summer. Um, and it's packed. Uh, the picture that you saw from earlier was in a C-17, a lot larger aircraft and a C-130 like this, imagine sitting, you know, with that gear the only way that either the, the Air Force personnel or others could get from sometimes from the front to the back of the aircraft was that they would walk on everybody. So they would call this a Hollywood jump. So when you're going to see people um, exiting, um, they're moving fast and they don't have any gear. So I think he's doing, he's doing the joke. If you've seen Talladega Nights and you're like, you know, he doesn't know what to do with his hands. I think he's making fun of me because I was fidgeting with my gear. This is probably one of my first, um, first duties. And he, you know, he was more of a veteran. So I think he was making fun of me because I was fidgeting with my gear. So I'm going to um, fast forward a bit now. So I'm looking for a specific part. So the jump master is going to stand up and he's going to sound off. It's the same thing every time. So when you're jumping up, they call off 10 minutes and then all the, you know, all the paratroopers echo back what get ready. So he's saying all these commands. He's saying all these commands and they're the same thing every time. So when you're doing something like this, um, muscle memory, muscle memory is really important. So, um, jumping is very dangerous. I've got, you know, lots of friends that have, you know, permanent injuries, uh, from it. Fortunately, um, I had, I have 27 jumps, um, and my knees still work, my ankles do. Um, but they do it the same way every time because it's almost, you know, you're all you're doing and it's because of the, you know, the fear, um, you know, things like that. Hey, I'm jumping out of a, I'm jumping out of an aircraft. Um, but same way every time they, they sound it all off. So he's going to go through all these commands. So there's some of the colorful language. So at this point I was telling him and you'll see here in a bit. So this is a static line jump. Um, it's not a like a high altitude, low opening. It's not like, you know, what the cool guy special operations do where they jump out of the, you know, the aircraft with nothing attached and they pull their own chute. When we jump out, they're hooked in and there's a static line that pulls the parachute certain, you know, certain distance out of the plane. Um, at this point, someone, cause I was making my way back to the, you know, to the, you know, to the back of the aircraft, someone's uh, static line had, um, come off a little bit. So that's what I was telling him about. I think I was able to get it fixed and they actually made the jump. And the parachute that I'm actually wearing is an Air Force parachute. 
I don't jump. The safety doesn't jump. The jump master does. Um, I had the mobility to kind of move around. I'm wearing a parachute because I'm in an aircraft and they open the doors, but um, the safety doesn't jump. So that's another jump master that he's talking to right now. And the cool guys by the door, the one guy by the door, every time I jump, almost every time I jump like this, the Air Force folks, they'd get on, you know, the loadies, um, the load masters. And it's like, why, why am I in the 82nd? Why am I doing this? I could do, you know, I could be in the Air Force. I could be cool like that. Um, <laughs> there were so many times we'd be sitting uh, at Fort Bragg where, where, you know, where you'd get ready to um, put all your parachutes on and get ready to board your aircraft. Um, there'd be so many times where these Air Force folks would show up and they'd get out of their aircraft, they'd get out of, you know, these big aircraft like it, and they'd have golf clubs, things like that. And I'm like, what, you know, okay. So anyways, they didn't get to jump out, you know, I guess they're not that cool. So, so you can see me getting into position there. The Air Force is in charge of the aircraft and they always are. So basically the Air Force is flying the path and then at a certain point, you know, he's communicating with the pilots and the navigators and stuff, and he's going to say, Army, your door. So this is going to happen here in just a sec. This was always when... I never got used to jumping, but this is all, you know, always, I, you know, I, I became more comfortable with it, but when the door would open like that, it would change the pressure inside the aircraft. And at this point, you knew it was real. You're like, okay, this isn't going to get stretched. I'm going to actually have to do this. So he just called a scratch. He's in communication with folks on the ground. There's people on the ground that are measuring airspeed, things like that, because if the if this you know if the if the wind is moving ladder, if it's moving too quickly on the drop zone, you're going to have you know a lot more injuries. So sometimes what they do, they would call it a racetrack, or they'd go back around. He just called it because he got the word that it's like it's too windy on the drop zone. So um, and when you know some of the things that 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 Mike did when he was check, so he was checking the door. You know, he was doing things like that and he was getting ready and we'll see it here in a little bit to start looking for. So I'm giving him a static line back. I had control of his static line while he was doing all that. So he's looking for, so we may have the, you know, we may have the okay to actually do it now. As a jump master for every drop zone on Fort Bragg, there were certain uh, points that you're looking for so that you can tell your paratroopers how, you know, how close to, to jumping that you are. Ultimately, the Air Force turns on the green light and the, the paratroopers exit, but it's the jump master's responsibility to look for his, uh, <laughs> his reference points and get his side of the aircraft ready. So now they're ready. He's watching the other jump master. And what they try to do is they try to alternate. So he tells his guys to go. And they try to alternate so that as you're exiting the aircraft, you're not meeting between, you know, that there's a bit of a stagger from the, uh, um, the paratroopers as they're exiting. This, I don't think this was sped up. This is how quickly you can exit, you know, Hollywood. So I'm right here right now trying to manage all these static lines. They're handing them to me so nobody gets held up in those. So that's what the safety does. And when they say to a you know, paratrooper talks about keeping their feet and knees together, you saw when he exited that his, you know, his feet went up into the air like that and then keeping your feet and knees together is important when you land. So in a second here, you're gonna kind of hear it go quiet and it's quiet for about 15 seconds. And you're like, okay, at least I'm out. But this is where some of the colorful language comes in. 
it's quiet. You're like, oh man, this isn't too bad. I exited okay. You know, I'm glad I did it. This is, um, you know, one of the bigger drop zones in Fort Bragg. And so what he's, what he's looking at right now is which way is the wind pushing me? And he's gonna pull on a couple of his risers on his parachute to try to close off that side of the parachute so, you know, so he's not pushing as hard. So I think the honeymoon's over. He's starting to realize, he's like, oh my gosh, I'm falling pretty fast. I'm getting pushed kind of hard. <laughs> so when you watch videos of super cool, you know, like the Golden Knights or whoever, if they're, you know, if they're parachuting into football games, things like that. Um, this is how, you know, you land with a, a static line parachute. It's not that soft stuff. So, but he's very elated um, that he's still alive. It's always the feeling you're like, nothing's broken. Yeah. So, <laughs> a perfectly good boat. <laughs> Why? All right. So, a few more army pictures. This is what we generally looked like. So, if we did an operation like that, we jumped in and we're doing some follow on follow on exercises. This is what we looked like when it was all done, and we're doing our after action types of meetings and stuff. So, um, there's me. There's a really good, you know, my best friend Miles. Um, you'll see him actually in some of my, you know, my other. Um, uh, pictures from, you know, the applied physics lab at the University of Washington. So we were on a readiness force. So I deployed to um, Iraq. This is in Haiti in 2010. They had a really bad earthquake. We were on a deployment schedule where if something happened like that, we needed to be ready to go in about 18 hours. So when the earthquake happened, we were there in about, we were there in about a day and a half. Um, we were there for about seven weeks. Um, and we really helped to get a lot of the non-government organizations set up um, and, you know, moving uh, food, water, uh, things like that. They'd have, um, you know, the, the civilian nurses and doctors and things that we could, um, you know, basically get them to the areas that they needed to go. So this, I think this is like an AP photographer that was taking photos. Um, interesting thing. Uh, we were on a training schedule to go to Afghanistan. So imagine training for months to do a completely different mission. And then, you know, you're doing more of a humanitarian mission. It's, it's, it was difficult to change gears uh, for combat soldiers. So, um, but we did our best. This is what, we, what it looked like. Um, you know, we slept next to that building for quite a while and then we actually moved out into a different area. So this is Haiti. Um, and, you know, their uh, airport, things like that, you know, radios, uh, coordinating things. Uh, and this is actually where um, getting into the next batch uh, at the University of Washington, you know, the uh, next part of my life um, is where I became reacquainted with Amber, uh, my wife, through Facebook. So uh, the only connection we had back home was a really slow satellite internet uh, connection. Facebook was really new me, to me back then. This is, you know, 2010. Um, and uh, Amber actually went to high school with, uh, with Professor Mackey and I. So this was pretty much the end of, um, you know, my time in the army. The reason I put this picture and then I put it on at the beginning was this was, this is my last jump. Um, and my wings are still buried. So generally, if you can, you take one of your airborne wings on your last jump and you bury it buried on the drop zone that you had, you know, you were on um, at Fort Bragg. So that's the end of the army. Um, I ended up in Seattle because of Amber and I was applying to any job that I could, I, I wasn't qualified for anything as, you know, as someone of the combat experience as a scout, I was just applying for everything. And the job um, that I was able to get was at uh, the applied physics lab at the University of Washington. So, um, 
the Applied Physics Lab, uh, it's a UARC, so it's a university affiliated uh, research center, I think. Um, but this is where I was for seven years. And I, when I first started, I just tried to get involved in as many projects as I could, interesting things. Um, so the, some of the projects that I was on were uh, gliders. So gliders, you know, they're, they're oceanographic um, equipment or, you know, or instruments but they use um, a buoyancy engine, the oil, uh, moving that in and out. They change their volume, their fixed mass, but they change their volume to, uh, you know, to leave the surface and to dive. Um, they're very efficient, uh, but they don't have a lot of power, you know, they, you know, because they don't have propellers. Um, you know, they, um, they can do about a half a knot, uh, the smaller ones. So sea glider is a smaller one. Karina is bigger. You'll see, you know, you'll see those in a little bit. Um, but, uh, that's what I worked on uh, for the next seven years. So this is what oceanography looks like. This is what going to sea looks like. You've got a lab, you get your stuff ready, you test it locally, you package it, and then you get it to the ship. You unload it, and then you load it onto the ship. Um, these are some of the details sometimes. It's nice, you know, the things that I've learned um, that I like to try with our, you know, our MHL interns is, you know, some of the detail related things like um, you can't pack too much because you can't take all of it, but you know, you want to try to take everything you need, um, you know, two is one, one is none kind of thing. So uh, I think this was in Woods Hole. Um, so, you know, loading it onto a, a Woods Hole, you know, loading, loading gear onto a Woods Hole vessel. So this is a sea glider. Uh, they were small enough that you could put two of them in a rib like that. That's a, you know, a university um, boat that we would take uh, to Puget Sound. Puget Sound was really nice um, for the testing that we would do on these because you could very quickly get into about 200 meters of water. So these gliders work best when they've got a lot of water because it, you know, it takes them a while to, to make their distance over ground. So sometimes it was difficult with the way the tides would move and the currents would be. Um, but this was a typical day uh, for me. So it was interesting going from, you know, the military to more of an academic setting like this. Um, <laughs> and you'll see in a while, some of, the, some of the pictures that I took, I couldn't believe that I was getting paid, you know, for this, so um, from where I came from. So this is, you know, Puget Sound. This is weeks and weeks of my life putting stuff into the water because you'd put it into the water and you'd be communicating with the pilot. The pilot could be, you know, the pilot could be in their, you know, in their living room. They could be back at, you know, back at the university, but the pilot would be piloting this. We just put it in the water for them. This is the Robertson. So this is, you know, one of APL's research vessels. Again, I spent so much time, you know, on this, you know, on that boat. Um, bobbing around, you know, waiting for, you know, gliders to come back to the surface. Um, this is, you know, the, this is another, you know, buoyancy, um, variable buoyancy glider that I worked on for quite a while. Karina, it's just bigger. So it had about three times the amount of oil that it could move um, to change its buoyancy. So it was very important to get the initial weight of these gliders very close to what they needed to be for basically for the density of water that you'd be working in. So you had to make them weigh, you know, very exact um, and, you know, very exact amount uh, for the, the density of water that you expected to work in. So for all of you that like data, this is generally what a dive would look like. It's pretty, it's pretty short. It's only 62 minutes, um, but you can see that this is the path that it took through the water, the depth, um, and some of these other things at the top would be um, the pitch. So when it moves its battery to affect pitch, and then the wings actually provide, you know, kind of the, the lift or, you know, the, um, the stability that it needed to actually move. Um, roll stayed pretty consistent. And then VBD is the, you know, variable buoyancy device where to get off the surface, you pump your oil in so that you become, you know, your volume is less. And you can see where, you know, it's got a really nice consistent slope to it where it's quiet. It's, you know, you're not doing anything else. You pump this all out and it can glide for a really long time. And then at the bottom, um, you can kind of see that the heading gets a little bit unstable because you slow way down and then you go back up again. They're slow. 
um, unless you're within uh, and you have the capability, you put it in and you won't know until it comes back to the surface whether it worked or not, unless you have some kind of a way to you know, communicate with it acoustically. So there's a lot of uncertainty when you put things into the ocean. Um, it, the ocean destroys, it, it just likes to destroy everything. So um, you've gotta be okay. We never named any of our vehicles. They were always numbered because you're always in danger of losing them. So um, this is more, I went on quite a few trips, uh, you know, from Guam to, you'll see Iceland here in a little bit, Guam, San Diego, um, you know, the key, you know, Florida Keys. Uh, there were some amazing times out on the water. Um, and these are sea gliders. This is testing. Um, I think this is part of the Mott Lake cut or you know whatnot that goes through the shipping channel that goes over to Lake Washington. But this is how we would test. These gliders would use Iridium um, satellites to communicate. So when they'd come to the surface, they'd download their data um, over Iridium. So we'd get up to the roof so that we could simulate dives, uh, things like that. So this is Miles, I, you know, he was the one that I served with. Uh, when he was getting close to getting out, um, at some point with my bosses at APL UW, they're like, are there any more of you paratrooper types? And I was like, well, there might be. So Miles was getting out and I said, hey, you know, you want to, um, uh, you know, you want to move to Seattle for a while, you know, and do this, uh, this crazy job that I have. Um, and there'd be times where we'd be out there together. So this was really, you know, kind of a bittersweet thing to come, back around full circle into the civilian world. And we'd be sitting out here in this boat, you know, kind of looking at, looking at each other being like, God, this is so different than we, you know, the way life used to be. So those are gliders, that's how they look. Um, they've got a real small surface, you know, profile signature um, and the, you know, there's the Iridium antenna. So, you know, more gliders. And these ones had, um, uh, you know, acoustic uh, capabilities. So we'd test them, um, you know, before we put them in the water. Uh, it was always interesting, you know, by this path right here, this is uh, Shul Shul Marina um, in Seattle, you know, and talking to people. So um, it's interesting here, learning naval architecture stuff. I learn it by driving the carriage when you guys are having your labs and your classes. Um, you know, I kind of I kind of learned things that way. I had to learn very quickly how to describe these gliders because interesting, you know, people would come up, they'd be interested, they'd be like, what is this? So I had to very quickly kind of have a, you know, a speech or, you know, um, be able to communicate about what they are. So, and just more, you know, this is, um, I forget what mountain range that is. I think that's looking west um, in uh, Puget Sound, so. Um, I put this in here. I took this picture because it was interesting. It took me 18 years to finish my undergrad degree. So I started before I went into the military. Um, and then I get to the University of Washington and I worked uh, with some, you know, for some folks that were really supportive. They said, you need to finish your degree. You know, we'll do whatever we can to help you with that. So um, I went to a, an advisor at the University of Washington and I said, here's, here's my transcript. And I had art and I had this and I had that. And I was like, what is the quickest thing that I can get <laughs> to get my bachelor's? Um, and it, you know, it ended up being a, a social science evening degree. So um, when I was picking classes, it, they're on uh, quarters there. So when I was picking classes, I actually emailed the professors beforehand and I would say, I'm gonna be gone for three weeks. You know, I'm going on a cruise, I'm, you know, work cruise, I'm doing this. Are you gonna be okay with me being out of your class for that long? And you know, some of them wouldn't be. Most of them were, um, but this is my life. And it's actually, this an interesting picture. Um, this is my life at whatever hotel we were at before or after a cruise. And when, even when we were on the cruises, I was reading because a lot of what I was doing was like, you know, high, you know, higher 400 level classes, you know, big, um, big, you know, big essays, things like that. So, but, you know, I didn't get up, you know, give up and eventually finished my, you know, my bachelor's in, uh, um, 2014. So, um, but it, this was an interesting class because I had a lot of direct experience with the military, you know, and policing. And it's, this is still, it was it's still really relevant today, um, you know, with uh, militarization of uh, police. Um, I wish I had more pictures of the Ballard locks. One of my favorite things to do was to go through the Ballard locks 
valid locks is between the Lake Washington and Puget Sound. Um, and the locks are there to keep Lake Washington, you know, at a certain level. Um, and the water always flowed out. So the fresh water always flowed out into um, Puget Sound. So it was always really fun to go through there, tying up the lines, the water comes up, you know, goes down, things like that. So this was the inside of, you know, my lab where we build these, um, you know, like any other academic lab, you know, that you've been around here. So, but they all separated like that into their different sections. Um, this was our life too. The first time we'd put certain things into the water, this was a real heavy kind of like a deep sea fishing, big fish, um, uh, you know, fishing line and reel um, that we, you know, we tie it to it. Um, and hope, you know, hopefully the glider would come back. So that was me. I'd sit there for four hours sometimes. So that's what the, you know, Karina looked like uh, from the surface. Here's more, you know, I think this was, yeah, this was in California. This is me and Jim Luby. Um, he might actually be watching right now. Hey, Jim. Um, he actually is the um, acoustics expert that works with uh, some of our interns. Um, so we worked together for about seven years. He's retired, but he does uh, some consulting now. So um, another interesting thing I did was I participated in an ice camp for the, for the Navy. It's called ISEX. Um, I've got some pictures of my personal experience here, but um, in the past few years, if you go onto YouTube and you, you, know, you search um, ISEX, so I-C-E-X, um, there's some interesting videos out there that describe it, but it's a Navy exercise where they, um, they can test uh, for under ice conditions for submarines, things like that. And it's also an opportunity to have a camp on an ice flow um, where other researchers can go and test underwater vehicles, communications, things like that. It's a, very, it's a very punishing environment. But basically this picture where I'm starting here is in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. So if you go all the way up to the tip of Alaska, Prudhoe Bay is the last part on land where you stop. Um, so Prudhoe Bay, it's basically an oil town um, where they do um, off of the slope up there where they do, um, you know, they, they extract oil. But this is Prudhoe Bay. The camp that you're going to see some pictures of here in, you know, in a, in a bit, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it's, it was over 100 miles north. So we'd go out into the water um, and we'd be on a piece of ice for as long, you know, for as long as it'll last. You'll see here that it didn't last as long as they wanted it to. So this is a plane that like bush pilots, so the, they'd get these pilots, they're bush pilots from Alaska. This is a plane that would go out when the, you know, there, there were some experts, ice experts, the Coast Guard, stuff like that. They'd be tracking some ice flows. And they're like, we think that this one would be a good one to maybe put the camp on. And, you know, the pilot and a few others would actually go out and land on it. And they would do testing to figure out, okay, this would work good for a runway. And this is, you know, this is other ice that would work good to put the camp on. So that's what that little plane looked like. They would go out sight unseen and land on ice, test it and say, okay, we can put the camp here. This is just more, um, these are the types of planes that they'd use to, um, to bring in gear. Since then, you know, they use Chinooks uh, from uh, Alaska. I think they even do um, airdrops from, you know, cargo aircraft, but this is my experience. This is actually flying out there. Um, so, you know, you're flying over this stuff and it's like, okay, we're really gonna land on this and we're gonna live on it for how long? Cause we'd set up through APL, I was part of the team that would set this place up and, you know, and then the, um, you know, the Navy would use it then the researchers would use it. So this is just ice, you know, thinking back on it now, it's a bit crazy. It's, it, <laughs> you're flying over it and you're like, okay, we're gonna land on that somewhere and I'm gonna live on it for, you know, four to six weeks. So this is what the camp starting looks like um, when, we, you know, when we're approaching and we may have had this. So to get things started, we'd come back to, you know, to, um, to Prudhoe Bay, you know, several nights, but at some point we'd stay out there. So you can actually tell from this picture that this is, you know, multi-year ice because the ice is older when it hits into itself, you know, and it's got, you know, the, um, you know, those, the, those looks to it. And then this is more single year ice. They like to use this for the runway. So it's, it's like being on another planet. It sounds different. Um, 
the ice makes different noises at night. And, you know, the, during the day was okay because you could see if a polar bear was coming, but the, the hardest part would be at night. Say you've got to go to the bathroom, it's pitch black, there's no lights, and there's these weird, eerie, you know, noises from the ice and things. Imagine skipping a stone. You know, if you've ever skipped the stone on really thin ice on a lake, it's those, you know, so anyways, it's like, you know, Star Wars. Um, so just more pictures, you know, of these, of this place. It was a really unique experience. No, they call that a sun dog. Um, I think it's because of, you know, the higher, you know, the higher, the further are you up, are up on the earth you are. I think it's a, you know, um, uh, an atmosphere thing. It was cold, but it was actually warmer out on the ice than it was in Prudhoe Bay sometimes because you're surrounded by all the ocean. There's me. Um, we wore sunglasses all the time because snow blindness is real because it's so bright. Um, so I had some really nice sunglasses that I would wear. Um, cause if you don't, it's, it's almost like you get, if you didn't do it, you'd, you'd feel like you have grit in your eyes. Uh, I think this is when the plane would leave for the night. Um, that was always tough because if it, you've got weathered out, you wouldn't get another plane for, you know, a few days. So and it's always weird. They wouldn't be coming back to the same place. Uh, cause you know, the, all the ice was moving. So when the, the, you know, the pilots and stuff would come back, um, you know, they'd have to fly to a, you know, a different GPS position. So I like that one cause of the moon, you know, the colors it's, it was just, you know, very, very interesting. So this is, uh, like I said, at, you know, kind of at the beginning, um, the ice broke up. So this was our runway, um, and they like to have contingency runways. I think we had one main runway and two contingencies, but you can see, and this will make sense, this big you know, kind of path right here in a second, but camp was over there, the ice was breaking up. Um, so this ice camp they do, they do it every two years. Um, I don't know exactly what, you know, what the, the Navy does, but some of the things they would do was they, you know, they want to learn how things sound, how to operate under the ice, things like that. And also with their torpedoes, their torpedoes um, behave differently under the ice, how, you know, with, you know, I'm not sure the specifics, but I put these pictures in here because there's a hole for the divers and then there's a hole for bringing out the um, torpedo. So because this ice camp broke up, um, it, it was cut short. Um, we had to grab this and go when the ice was breaking up. So divers go on, go under the ice. Uh, it's pretty dangerous. And you'll see in a second, one of the first things they do, and I mean, this, this will make sense to some of you more than others, but the first thing that the, Na the Navy says to do for the divers is to cover the props. So um, it's, it's a torpedo, but you can't see the props, so it's okay. Um, and then more of the ice, that's the last one. Oh, no, it's not. This is cool. So the way they get to the, the sailors on and off the subs is that they actually come to the surface. And I don't have a lot of good stuff about that, but you know, if you're interested in it, ISEX on um, YouTube shows a lot you know, more you know, in depth. So um, they came up here. Uh, and I think one of the things they like to do with this is it gets um, you know, kind of important people up to the ice and then they can get them on and off the subs you know, in this environment. So. They came up, people got on, they, you know, they got off. So, and then this is the last one. This is Prudhoe Bay. This is coming home. So another cool trip that I was able to go on is Iceland. Um, we worked off of Iceland for a little while um, and uh, it's beautiful. Um, I, think, I think it's it's small, you know, it's, it's, it's a tiny place. There's not a lot of people. Um, and but it's it's beautiful you know so there were times when it's like you know i felt um you know we're doing research and things like that and you know people just you know the icelanders just wanted to go on with their daily lives um this is the ship we worked off of when they when we were there uh the henson and um you know the north you know where, where we were um uh it's just it, it's it's a really harsh environment there's a lot of interest in how um, systems can work up there, not a lot of light, um, you know, very harsh environment. So there's me, I think we're, we're leaving the harbor. Um, this was really cool. So when we were leaving, um, this was a, a museum 
in uh, Keflavik. Keflavik's where the, the airport is. And in a few slides, I'll show you, you know, show you the guy. Basically, the guy that made all these, there's hundreds of them. He's just a retired fisherman. So um, it's just these beautiful, uh, beautiful models. Um, and it's really interesting now to come to, you know, to a naval architecture community because he worked off of, you know, the drawings to build this. He built them all by hand. This is his first one. So this is why I put this one in here. It's like, you know, sometimes when you start something, like look at how beautiful these are. And he made hundreds. And this is where he started. And it, actually the lady, the curator of the place, I was like, which is the first one? And she's like, oh, you know, like he's, I think he's, you know, passed since then, but, you know, she didn't want to point out the first one because he wasn't as proud of it, but there it is. Um, and this, this is the gentleman that did it. So, you know, he retired from fishing and he made models. So, um, you know, so he'd get the lines and he'd, you know, he'd make them. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend any of these, but please read them. <laughs> yes. The seas got really rough there. So, I, you know, the, 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 people that, the people that live there, oh, you know, the, the sea state that they would be going out, you know, used to going out in versus, you know, us, us you know, Americans and whatnot. I mean, they're, oh, you know, yeah, so. There's that. Uh, there's a really cool um, Viking museum in Keflavik as well. Um, and just what they used to, you know, what they used to uh, sail in, um, but just the lines, um, the construction, it's amazing. You know, an open, open vessel like that, just coming over to, you know, coming over to the, uh, you know, North America. It's, it's amazing to, you know, to think about. Um, I think, yeah, some of these, so some of these pictures just kind of here towards the end, you know, bring it to a close. Um, I spent some amazing times at sea, lots of awesome pictures. You can see people out on the bow right there where, you know, when after dinner, whatever, we weren't doing operations at night, um, people watching, you know, the, uh, the, the sunsets and, and whatnot. I mean, there was some amazingly, you know, beautiful times out there. Same with Puget Sound. So this is San Diego. Um, in a few slides here, I don't, again, I was getting paid to do this. It was crazy. So we would go, you know, we'd go out of the, the harbor there in San Diego and you could see whale watching boats and things like that. And I'm working, I'm getting paid. And this was what, you know, this is what we got to see. Dolphins. So my last cruise was on a, you know, this, this ship was amazing. Um, one of the reasons I put it in here was because it was my last cruise at APL, but I also put it in here because I don't know if it's this exact one, but this, um, this style of ships are the ones that are now starting the ocean cleanup. So they're doing the big, um, you know, they're pulling those, the, you know, the nets and things. And the crew of this ship, this was back in uh, 2018, they were really interested. One of the reasons they were doing some stuff with us, with our research group, was that they, um, you know, getting out of just uh, working with oil and gas and doing things like this. Um, these ships are massive, they're amazing. Um, but they, you know, they're now doing, uh, they're cleaning up the, you know, the garbage patch. Uh, just an impressive vessel. I was really impressed with this, you know, where they, you know, the two operators could, you know, operate the winches and things like that, the way that the control they had over things, the way that the, you know, the chairs move. And it was so impressive that, you know, this huge vessel, you know, the station keeping ability that it had, I mean, it was like, it, you know, it just really impressive, um, you know, ship. So and there it is from a distance. Um, last project that I worked on and some of the things, so as I'm getting here towards the end, um, oceanography, uh, marine engineering that 
I just kind of wanted to show some of the things that I, you know, I was able to work on. So this is just an off the shelf kind of titanium arm that they could put on ROVs. What was interesting about this is that this control right here, you know, was uh, historically, you know, traditionally used for like remote uh, surgery. Um, and there was a startup company from UW that was getting more precise controls and feedback like that to, you know, to control, you know, titanium robotic arms and things. So, um, you know, so that's kind of the stuff that I ended up doing, putting it into a big frame like that. And this is a tank um, at UW Oceanography. So, um, this is this is gumbo. So this is between um, a couple. Uh, we had two trips to Iceland. That's actually an Icelandic blanket. Uh, it's you know amazingly handmade. I put this in there because you know you've seen it, or maybe your cats have done it, or your dogs have done it. When when you're traveling, when you're leaving, when you're going somewhere, they get in your suitcases because they either don't want you to go or they miss you or whatever. And I put this in here to show that I did all these things, but there's a reason that I'm here. I loved the experiences that I had, but it was hard to be away. So. That's gumbo. And these are just, you know, hopefully, Chris, will this be, is Chris oh, he, back? He, he went. This will be available. I, these aren't links or anything, but these are just places that, you know, when you folks are looking at the next five years, you know, what do I want to do? These are some places to maybe get you started that, um, you know, to think about, because, uh, I, you know, I was at, the University of Washington and a lot of these places, you know, we had some kind of collaboration with, um, but they're doing really neat things um, in the water. So, um, and then this has always been one of my favorite paintings, um, just kind of wandering and I've, I've done, done quite a bit of that, but uh, I, I kind of had to go through all that stuff to be able to, you know, to be the technician, uh, to, to contribute to the MHL the way that I do today. So I kind of had to go through all that stuff. So uh, that's it. Um, hopefully if you had questions from way at the beginning, you still remember them, but that's, that's all I got. So thank you so much. An hour. Hi. Victoria. Hello on an iceberg, do you have to eat ready-made food packages or do you have real food? They do. So since I was involved with it, the Navy has taken over it quite a bit more. They do a lot more of the, you know, the prepackaged stuff, you know, now. Um, when we went, we actually had the, um, the chef from the, the Thompson, the Tommy Thompson, it's the U University of Washington's uh, um, research vessel. We actually had, you know, really good food. So, and they would try like, so the, the folk, when we were working there, they would try to feed us 5,000 calories a day. So we're just eating because you're out in the cold because the way the cold saps the energy out of you. So we were, yes, we ate well and we, you know, um, they wanted us to eat all the time. So, yeah. Any other questions? So when you were at uh, University of Washington with the lighters, how much of that were you actually making versus how much of it was actually like you guys got it from someone else and you put it together. So we did, um, our electrical engineers designed the boards um, and they would get, you know, stuffed elsewhere. We wouldn't do any of the aluminum. Um, having a vessel like that has to be a very specific aluminum, you know, machine to, to real tight tolerances. We would kind of get everything and assemble it. Um, so, but I would make a lot of wiring harnesses. So everything that connected circuit board to circuit board, I was making a lot of wiring harnesses, um, crimping wires, soldering. Um, but, uh, yeah, we would get it all. Uh, it was a, it was a major operation to, you know, to get, um, lots of different places, you know, to make the stuff and then, you know, assemble it. So, um, we ended up making, uh, after a while, ONR bought some, you know, some of the gliders and, and whatnot, and they still make sea gliders. Um, but yeah, we, we'd mainly just assemble them. Follow up. How much do those like cost? <laughs> oh, the smaller ones are probably just the basic glider without a lot of the, you know, cause sometimes the, the, um, uh, the instruments are what cost a lot. The basic glider, maybe one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. The bigger ones, four hundred and upwards. 
So, but just the aluminum, the machining alone, um, you know, cause the, the, you know, the, the, the rate of depth on, you know, some of those were a thousand, you know, a thousand meters. So um, the aluminum was really expensive. What was like the adjustment for you, like doing like some of those like non-typical jobs going back to like almost like a nine to five? <laughs> like, like... So they, there were some, some people when you'd go on a cruise, they call it C-hab, you know, rather than rehab. So when you'd go to C, it's almost like you get away, you have very little, you know, interaction because it's expensive to have internet connection and things like that. Um, when you'd come back, it's it'd probably take almost a week, you know, because you're, you know, you're doing the things at sea, you know, it's, it's more hours. Um, it was hard. Um, and it was hard, you know, if your stuff, you know, because you'd be waiting for your stuff. So you'd have to, sometimes you'd have, you know, two or three different projects going on at the same time. So you'd come back, you'd work on another project for another researcher or something like that. Then your gear would come back. So it was a lot of switching gears. Um, it really, it, Getting used to that then has really helped me be, you know, effective here as a technician when things are changing with, you know, um, the stuff going in and out of the tank, interns, things like that. But it, it wasn't easy. So after all of that, why did you choose to come to Michigan? We're from here. Um, my all of our all of our family still lives up in Traverse City or, you know, down here in, you know, southeastern Michigan. So um, it was hard being away. And, you know, we're, we're in our 40s now. So um, nieces, we don't, we don't have kids, but nieces and nephews were growing up and, you know, things like that. And we were missing out. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to get back to be with family. You own that house you built? No, no. Funny thing about that house, I built it uh, in 2005. The bottom dropped out of everything in like 2008, especially for Michigan. I it took out a construction loan. Um, I still owned it when I was in the, when I was in the army. I sold it in 2012 finally, and I still had to bring two thousand dollars to closing. So I don't have it anymore. <laughs> So, you know, somebody else has, you know, has a nice, it's, it's on like three and a half acres up in Northern Michigan. So it's nice. Um, but it was tough. Um, I'm glad I kept it, you know, but yeah, it's things back then are completely different than the housing market is now. Could so. we start a list and you can just start making us all a house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll get a team of interns to do that. So, yeah. <laughs> How did you make your transition from, I think you said your last position was in Ireland to here? So I spent some time in Iceland for, you know, for a work trip um, to here. So my, my, my wife, Amber, actually works for mechanical engineering in, in administration. Um, we, we moved here with just her having a job. Um, and uh, Professor Mackey, actually, you know, was, was a bit of a help kind of, you know, suggested, you know, some things, but I was hoping that coming back here, having a background in research uh, was going to help me get into, you know, very, the, the, almost the exact position that I have now. Um, but I knew that I wanted to, you know, to work in a, you know, um, you know, kind of a, a research lab uh, type of thing. So this is nice because it's um, it's more 40 hours a week. It's not, you know, that's with some of those things, when you get the money and the, the sponsor wants, you know, their data or they want, you know, they want results, um, you go, go, go. So it's been nice to slow down, but. Any other questions? Awesome. Well. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks again. So.